Welcome everyone to this week's video lecture for History 1305 or U.S. History to 1877. So, uh, we're picking up with the subject today of the uh, early Anglophone colonies, um, and I've also posted up a few case studies, and these case studies are interesting because they highlight specific as aspects of English colonial society. In particular, it shows us the difference between two really different regions in, Amer in America's uh, English-speaking colonies. Uh, we're going to be looking at Bacon's Rebellion uh, from uh, Colonial Virginia, and then we'll also be taking a look at religious fundamentalism amongst the Puritans in New England by way of the Salem Witch Trials. But before we get there, we need to talk about the establishment of these English-speaking colonies. Um, so, if we go way back to the 1500s and 1600s, the Americas look quite a bit different than they do today, as you could imagine. Europeans are scrambling around trying to seize the most land and resource-rich territories. Uh, you have the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Portuguese, and the English all flooding into the Americas and vying for territorial influence and wealth. Now, what you need to take away from uh, this sort of uh, multi-nation push for imperialism and colonialism in the Americas is that each one of them had a slightly different focus. Um, now, when you look at the French, the French are sending mostly hunters and trappers to trade with Native Americans for furs. Uh, they're hunting, uh, they're moving along the Mississippi River Valley, mostly up in the northern Mississippi River, um, areas like uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, the Great Lakes territories. Um, and then also they have an established settlement in New Orleans down in Louisiana, the southern end of the Mississippi River. Technically, they own it all on paper in the early colonial period. But what's important to know about the French is that they're, they're sending mostly young men between the ages of 18 and 25, um, sometimes even a little bit younger, more like 15 or 14. Uh, but the point is that these guys are coming here. They have no intention of staying in the Americas. They don't want to live in the Americas. As far as the French are concerned, uh, the, what will be the United States and Canada and all these regions, they are backwater hellholes. They don't want to be here. They come from what they consider to be the height of civilization and culture, uh, particularly artistic uh, culture in Europe. And so their attitude towards the Americas are, let's get over there, make money, and then come home. The idea is make money and then go back to France. And so you don't see a large settler population building up with the French. Uh, the Spanish have a different focus. Having coming out of, they're coming out of the Spanish Inquisition and the Long Reconquista. So the Spanish are innately, more so than any other European counterpart, the Spanish are really keenly focused on mission work, on conversion. Their attitude is that not only are they here to get wealth, gold, build businesses and colonies to extend their empire, they also have a duty to convert the Native Americans of these colonies to Christianity. So effectively, the way that Spanish colonial societies worked is you had the European Spaniards were in charge of the colonial infrastructure. They were the power in these colonies. But the massive groups of laborers that they need were largely drawn from forced or conscripted labor of Native Americans. In other areas around the Americas, mostly in the islands of the Caribbean and the West Indies, the Spaniards uh, are going to be among the first to turn to African slaves as a source of labor as well. Um, so, finally, we have the British and, and the English-speaking colonies. Uh, and this is the one with which we're most acutely concerned because, as you're all probably well aware, uh, it is the Anglophone colonies that will give rise to the United States of America. Uh, so, the British are focusing very heavily on establishing a settler class. Uh, generally, what they're trying to do is rebuild England in the New World. That's why when they come to uh, the Northeast, they call that region New England. They have places like New York. Um, and so the whole idea is that they're coming here trying to rebuild, settle with their families. Uh, the British, a lot of their settlers have no illusions or desires about going back to Europe. They don't really want to go back. Um, and so they're coming here and settling permanently. And that distinguishes them from the other Europeans, and it's largely why we're doing this class in English here today. The uh, British are just eventually going to come to outnumber all of their neighbors around the New World. Um, and so that's how they tend to become dominant in the eastern part of what is now the mainland United States. Um, so, the first permanent Anglophone or English-speaking colony uh, in what is now the United States was the Jamestown Colony of Virginia. Virginia. 
This was founded in 1607 and it's located in the Chesapeake Bay region of the United States. Um, and it was widely thought that they dis they picked this particular location because it was easily defensible. Um, and so what, what we're seeing is that this isn't the first attempt of the English to establish a colony here, but they had made some other attempts in the Carolinas that didn't work so well, um, and also a few other attempts up in the Northeast that they had to abandon. Jamestown is the only place, is the earliest place in America that's founded where you can still go to Jamestown today. Uh, it's still a community there in Virginia. Um, so. They were given the, the settlers for this colony uh, were given a charter, uh, and this charter was issued by King James the first, and they creatively named it Jamestown. Um, it was backed up. The charter was given to uh, a number of wealthy London-based merchants, uh, and the idea is that they, they own a business, and that's what we call a charter colony. The king is giving a business, in particular, this business was originally called the London Company, and then later the London uh, Virginia Company of London. Uh, but they're, these businessmen who own this, this incorporated entity um, are given a charter and said, you can go and settle this land on your own dime, and then you get to share in the profits of the colony. And that's what a charter colony looks like. That's how it works. And that's how Jamestown was established. Uh, now, Jamestown was not immediately profitable the way its in investors might have hoped. Um, there were three major factors that led to a period of crisis in the early colony that we call the starving time. Um, and there you can see a, a bolded out term in the PowerPoint lecture. This is usually a good indicator that it's going to show up later on a study guide and then in a future date on your exam. So it's very important to be familiar uh, with this. The starving time lasts for a couple of years. It's usually dated. There, there's some discrepancy on when we actually locate the beginning and end of the starving time. But it's generally the period between 1609 and 1611. Uh, but the colonists made three critical mistakes. Number one, they set this colony up right on the coast. Uh, and because of that, every time they'd go into the ground to try and tap into the water table, they're pulling up salt water, not fresh water. And so this leads to a lack of clean drinking water, which leads to the spread of disease in this colony early on. Um, secondly, they settle along the uh, slow moving and brackish James River in Virginia. Uh, if you're familiar with Virginia's sort of climate and ecology, this is a very hot, humid area of the country, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, it's not unusual to, to have 100 degree days here in the summer times with almost total humidity in the air. Um, and because of that, there is a large presence of malarial mosquitoes in this region. The European settlers who moved into this territory have no immunity to malaria, and so they start die dying off in great numbers because of their exposure to this disease. Finally, they made some poor economic choices as it pertains to mining, mineral resources, and gold. Um, in particular, what's happening here is the British are kind of late in the colonial game. The Spanish had already seized a lot of territory by the time the English showed up. So... The issue here is that the British are reading everything the Spanish are writing, and the Spanish are in Mexico, and they're in the Caribbean, and they're in South America. And they're re the English are reading all these writings, they're going, there's gold everywhere. The Spanish can't turn around without hitting gold. Um, and so the British assume this must be true in Virginia as well, but it's not. There's no gold in this region of Virginia. But they spend the first few years when they're establishing the colony just sort of meandering around looking for mineral deposits, for gold deposits that don't actually d exist. So they wasted a lot of time trying to uh, establish this um, sort of uh, uh, move towards mining gold, gold out of Jamestown that would never really come to fruition. They could have been setting up farms and building a more sustainable colony, but they didn't. Um, and so those are all factors that contribute to the starving time. And then the biggest factor... Um, is the, the breakdown in relations with the local Powhatan Native Americans. Uh, and so the British don't really readily adapt their customs to be viewed as diplomatic towards the Powhatan. So very early on, tensions emerge between these groups. And from 1609 to 1611, we know that the Powhatan did not allow the Jamestown settlers to leave the immediate boundaries of their colony. So they couldn't go out and plant, they couldn't go out and gather, and they couldn't go out and hunt. And this is a major factor in the starving time. Uh, and despite what Disney's had us uh, you know, sort of believe, Pocahontas and John Smith did not establish a lasting peace between these two groups.
Uh, that's something we'll look at a little bit later in our lecture. Uh, but first, we need to turn our attention to an issue of colonial governance. Uh, the English established three types of charter colony, or three types of colonies, sorry. Uh, they have three different types, and we already saw the example of Jamestown being a charter colony. That's the first type. That is where a charter or a legal document is bestowing the rights to colonize a land to a company or co corporation. It's where the English government is giving a business uh, the ability to invest in and then uh, reap the profits from their colonies. That runs in stark contrast to what is known as a proprietary colony. This is where a charter would be granted to an individual, a person, or their families in perpetuity. Um, and so what we're looking at here is that this is where one person is going to be given all the authority in the colony. And then finally, we have a royal or what's also known as a crown colony. This is where the colony is being directly run by the monarch of England themselves, whether it's a king or a queen. Now, despite the fact that you have these three different types of colonies, um, and you will need to know the difference between these on, when we get to our first exam, uh, all Anglophone colonies fell under English common law, which means they have to follow all of the laws that are enacted and enforced in England. Um, all of these colonies were the property of and ruled by the sitting monarch of England at the end of the day. In other words, even, the, even if you're not a royal, a, a royal colony, a proprietor can have their charter be running a colony, and if the king doesn't like how it's going or they fall, the proprietor falls out of favor with the, the king, their charter can be revoked and it becomes the property of the British government. The same is true for a business running a charter colony. Um, all of the Anglophone colonies had three branches of government, a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. Um, that's something that should look largely familiar, us, familiar to us here in modern America. Um, now, finally, all of the Anglophone colonies had a governor or some for, form of elected or representative government. They would have one person who's put in power of the, on the ground in the colony. But they also had bodies, democratic bodies, that helped inform decision-making processes in the colonies as these things played out. Um, so, Jamestown, as a charter colony, is not doing well by the time we get to 1611. Um, and the, they're coming out of the starving time at that point, uh, it, and they're surviving it, but their population has just been decimated. They've really been driven into the ground. Um, and that's when an Englishman by the name of John Rolfe will begin experimenting with tobacco agriculture in the Jamestown colony. And this would lead to the first shipment of tobacco going to England in 1613. Um, so as an interesting side note to history here, uh, it's actually John Rolfe, not John Smith, who ends up marrying Pocahontas after she converts to Christianity. They'd eventually uh, move back to England where she would serve as a symbol of what they call the civilizing mission in the Americas. Uh, basically, the civilizing mission is this idea that it's okay to go in and take resources and land from Native Americans because ultimately their exposure to European culture will civilize them. Um, and so it's a way of justifying the colonial mission on the ground. Um, so the crop itself of tobacco you have to remember, back in this day, it would be completely anathema to go to a European person and say, here, I found this plant that I dried, I picked the leaves, I dried it up, and then I rolled it in some paper. Now you set it on fire and you, you inhale the smoke in your lungs. Um, so there's no market for this in Europe. And that's where Sir Walter Raleigh comes in. Uh, he will actually go around Europe popularizing tobacco amongst the wealthiest people, getting them to smoke. Um, and then once they've adopted it, the rest of Europe will follow suit. And so all of a sudden, there is now a high, high demand for Europe, uh, uh, tobacco back in Europe. And that is going to lift the Jamestown colony out of these really tough economic times. It starts to get a booming economy going. Uh, now, here's the thing. Tobacco is super successful. It's actually too successful because nobody is focusing on food production. Uh, there is this issue of Everybody wants to make money off of tobacco agriculture. So with that being the case, nobody's taking the time to plant corn. Nobody's taking the time to plant the staple crops that you can eat. No one wants to waste their time raising animals that you can eat uh, because they're all trying to make money in the tobacco trade. Uh, and so disease and poverty and, and uh, starvation 
is another serious problem. It doesn't go away with the foundation of the tobacco agriculture that's going to be established uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, but right here, I'd like to just do a, a little brief summary of, of Pocahontas' place within this history. Um, obviously, we all remember the Disney story of Pocahontas, where uh, she basically sees John Smith sight unseen, falls in love with this white guy the first time she sees him, and then saves him from being killed by her father, in which case they fall in love and create this bridge of understanding and peace uh, uh, between whites, uh, English speakers, and the uh, Powhatan Native Americans that surrounded them. Uh, the reality of the story is much different. Uh, in fact, the story itself with John Smith is largely considered by many historians of the United States to be uh, BS. It's just a bunch of baloney. Uh, if you go back through John Smith's writings, he has a, a tendency to make things up, to, to just put it very bluntly. Uh, and as historians, we can go back in his personal writings, and he tells the exact same story about a Turkish princess uh, uh, when he was fighting in the Crimean War um, over in Europe. And so what's interesting here is that we're seeing the same stories repeating itself. He's just changing the location and the actors. Uh, but it's always... A beautiful princess loves him so much that she runs and throws herself in there to save him. Uh, and so when you see somebody telling the same story twice under two different circumstances about two different places, two different people, uh, it starts to get you a little suspicious. And historians are suspicious of this story. They tend to think that he was pretty much just making it up. Uh, but there is some, if you are going to believe the story itself, the, the, the sort of overview that he was about to be killed by this war chief, and she threw himself over him and, and protected him. Uh, if there is any truth to that, then it, you need to ground this in Powhatani and, and general Native American cultures. Um, this is not necessarily her saving him from being killed. Uh, most anthropologists agree that what this was was an overture of peace from the Powhatan people. Uh, what they were essentially doing is ritually killing John Smith, who was the governor of the uh, colony, of the Jamestown colony. They ritually killed him by pretending they were going to smash his head in with this big war club. Um, and the reason for this is not because they wanted to kill him. They had no animosity towards the guy. They actually wanted to create peace. By ritually killing him and having the daughter, uh, a, a princess of the tribe, essentially step in and save him, this is a ritual rebirth. It's symbolic. It means you, you've died and you've been reborn as a Powhatan person. And they're hoping by making him a Powhatan person, he can build a bridge of peace between the English speakers and the Powhatani. Uh, now, ultimately, that's not going to happen. For Pocahontas's part uh, in this whole role, she is involved in John Smith's stories. Obviously, there's some skepticism about the validity of these stories at all. But Pocahontas has a far more important place in colonial American history. Um, and on the slideshow within the PowerPoints, I, I gave you the only real image of Pocahontas during her lifetime is the black and white engraving that you'll see on the left when I show those three pictures of her. Uh, and here we can see her dressed in English clothing. Uh, and around her on the border of this image, it says Powhatani Imperial Virginia. Matawaka. Uh, Rebecca Fila Potentis uh, Principa Powhatan. Uh, so what you're seeing here is essentially what that's saying in Latin is Matawaka was her original name. It was never Pocahontas. That was kind of a nickname that people who knew her well called her. Uh, she took the English name Rebecca, and she serves as a symbol for the civilizing mission in England. When they put images like that of uh Pocahontas uh, or Matawaka around English society, what that does is it reinforces this idea in an English speaker's mind, which is, look, we've gone over there and taken this native princess. And remember, they see the native people as savages at this point. We've taken this native princess and we turned her into a proper British woman. Um, and so that's something that it, it, we're, we're doing good for the people over there is what that's meant to imply. Um, and so... Ultimately, uh, what you're seeing there is this push to justify, on a moral basis, why Europeans are in the Americas in the first place. We know they're there for power. We know they're there for wealth. We know that they're there for resources. But in their minds, they are trying to justify all this push to get these very materialistic things, uh, these very superficial things, by saying it's actually not for us. It's for the good of Native Americans.
Um, and so you can see the rhetoric that comes along with the colonial mission. Um, so around 1618 we're gonna, and 1619, we see some major reforms going on, political and economic, in the Jamestown Colony. In 1618, we see the establishment of the House of Burgesses. This will give the colonists, it's an elective body that gives the colonists a chance to put their own leaders and representatives in charge. What it does is it limits the Virginia Company's ability to make decisions on the day-to-day -day operations of the colony. This is often considered the first form of representative government within the English-speaking colonies. Um, so, in 1619, a year later, the tobacco is booming. Tobacco is everything in the Jamestown colony. Uh, but when you look at the problem with tobacco, it's very labor intensive, and they have a shortage of labor here in Jamestown. To try to correct this, they institute something known as the headright system in 1619. What this, does, this is supposed to incentivize moving to the Americas for English speakers. Um, it guarantees 50 acres of land for every man who could get his way onto a boat, pay for his passage to the Americas. If he could get to the Virginia colony, he would automatically get 50 acres of land in which he could cultivate mostly tobacco. And then he would get 50 acres more for every dependent that he brought with him, 50 more for a wife, 50 more for each child. Um, and so a, a large family that moved into this colony could get a massive tract of land and start making a lot of money in the tobacco trade. Um, so you can see that the, the motivation here for England is to not just get single men like the French, not just get missionaries and administrators like the Spanish. They want families to move into this new colony. However, the headright system simply doesn't do enough to encourage labor to come to the colony. There's, the issue is uh, really that people who could afford to pay their way over uh, generally are not going to want to leave England in the first place. They're doing okay over there. Um, and so with the headright system not working, Jamestown needs to find another way to come up with labor. And their way of doing this is to look to the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, they are going to purchase what they legally class at this point in time as indentured servants. Uh, but this is actually the first group of African slaves being moved into what is now the mainland United States. This is occurring in 1619, which is why last year uh, they recognized that as being 400 years of slavery. Um, and so in 2019, it was considered 400 years of slavery. Uh, now, this date, it can be a little bit misleading. Uh, because technically it's not the beginning of s slavery in America, because legally speaking, these individuals were not legal slaves. They were indentured servants, like their white counterparts who were brought into these colonies as indentured servants. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what indentured servitude is, uh, this is a system in which if I owe a debt over in Europe, if I'm living in England and I owe a debt to somebody and I can't pay it, I'm faced with two choices. I either get thrown in prison until I pay the debt, and that begs the question of how do you earn money to pay a debt if you're sitting in a jail cell. So I basically am going to get thrown in prison in Europe, or I can go to the Americas, work in the, in the tobacco industry for no money just to pay my debt off. Um, and then after four or five years when my debt's paid off, now I'm a free person again and I can go do what I want to do. Um, and that is technically what the first shipment of African people brought into the colonies was classed as. Now, in reality, most historians are going to argue this is the beginning of slavery because they were not treated the same as their white indentured servant counterparts. Um, and they would ultimately live as second class citizens within this colony, although they did. Uh, many of these individual uh, uh, indentured servants brought in in 1619 did eventually gain their freedom and live as free black people in the Jamestown colony. Um, so that is a major, major shift um, in the uh, sort of overall uh, economic patterns of what's going to start happening. Now more and more, the English-speaking settlers in the Chesapeake Bay will look to slave labor as a way to cultivate tobacco. Um, so Ultimately, everything is going pretty smoothly on an economic level for the Jamestown colony. But there is a major incident in 1622 known as the Indian Massacre of 1622. Uh, this is largely a Native American response 
to ex rapid expansion in the Jamestown colony. Uh, Native Americans are going to attack the colony and its adjacent settlement after they had spread out along the James River looking for arable land where they could plant tobacco. This upset the Native Americans, and the Powhatan got together and attacked the settlement, ultimately killing 347 settled. We don't know how many Native American deaths there were because there's no records of it at that time. Nor do we know if there was some acute cause of the attack, like an incident that led directly to this attack. Uh, now, on the, on the ground, Jamestown is going to survive the incident, but the smaller settles that had settlements that grew as a part of Jamestown, that as part of this economic expansion and growth, they were forced to, to be abandoned, and those colonists turned back inwards towards the core original area of settlement in Jamestown. Uh, on a political level, this was a major shift. Uh, the King of England is going to revoke, King James will revoke the Virginia Company's charter as a response to this in 1624. Basically, the furor over this incident in England is so much that uh, the king has to respond. And he says, look, you have screwed this up. He looks at the Virginia Company and says, you are not doing your due diligence. You're not doing your job on the ground in Jamestown. So he revokes their charter. And from 1624 onward, Jamestown would be ruled as a royal colony. That is the significance. And I always say we're looking for these patterns of cause and effect. I'm highlighting the Indian Massacre of 1622 because the significance is, is that it forces the British government, it forces the king to say these businesses that are, the business that's running this colony is simply not uh, doing what they need to do to keep the people safe. And so the king will take the colony over on his own. Um, so we are now, we, we finished talking about the Virginia colony and I just kind of I'm briefly jumping around. There is another colony, and your textbook kind of glosses over Maryland. Maryland is the other colony in the Chesapeake Bay. It's established immediately to the north of Virginia. Uh, James I, here to understand why Maryland is being founded, uh, it is a very, very complicated. You have to dive back into European history. And to keep this video lecture brief, I'm not going to talk too much about that. The textbook and my PowerPoint lecture uh, go into a lot of, of detail on that. But more, more or less, England's Catholics are, are going to be seen as second-class citizens. They're not treated um, as equal citizens in England. And there is a particularly high-ranking Catholic, a guy named Cecil Calvert. Uh, his title in England is the Second Lord of Baltimore. Uh, he is going to take advantage of a political shift in England uh, and see a softening stance in the monarchy towards their treatment of Catholics. And in 1632, he is going to found the Maryland colony to be England's Catholic colony. The idea is that people, the Catholic populations of England that are facing persecution are going to leave England and settle in Maryland so that they can practice their religion free of interference. Um, so, this all is rooted in the Protestant Reformation. That's a, an event that happens in the mid-1500s where all of the English, uh, the well, well, England, I should say, um, and most of the Germanic-speaking countries like Germany, England, Scandinavian nations like Norway and Sweden, the Netherlands, all of those English-speaking countries rejected the Catholic Church and became Protestants of different types. Um, and so that's a major part of England's history that's going to get carried over. And we'll talk about that when we look at the foundation of colonial New England. Uh, but it suffices to say that when England becomes a Protestant nation, Catholics are going to suffer. And so they start to move to the Maryland uh, uh, colony. And J uh, uh, Lord Baltimore is going to establish a place for them to practice their religion and try to make their money and their livelihood. Uh, he learned from some of the mistakes in Virginia, and, and in Maryland, they don't go through this big starving time because he forces his colonists to first grow enough food to feed themselves before he lets them start turning towards tobacco agriculture. Uh, now, over time, it becomes clear Catholics are not going to be enough to populate this settlement. So ultimately, uh, what will happen is he needs to start bringing in Protestants as well. And so over time, you uh, see that the elected members of the Maryland uh, uh, sort of government, the people who form the elective government in Maryland, are largely Protestant by 1640. Whereas Calvert himself and the proprietor of the uh, colony 
as as uh, as a Catholic. And so this is going to lead to rather slow growth. That's why Maryland kind of gets overlooked in the Chesapeake Bay because they're not growing by leaps and bounds in the same way that Virginia is. Um, and so they're they're still cultivating tobacco. And that's the big part of uh, life in the Chesapeake Bay is tobacco agriculture. In fact, that defines it. Um, and so as we move on through our lecture, I talk about what that really means to be a tobacco agriculture economy. Um, so first, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what this means is that the Chesapeake Bay colonies would revolve around mercantile economies, and they were always looking at this issue of profit maximization. So they need, the major economic output of these colonies is the export of tobacco. And in order to do that profitably, you need to make sure that you're selling it at the highest price and you're moving the best quantity of it that you can across the Atlantic at the cheapest price. Um, and so they're really, it's a hyper-competitive life in the Chesapeake Bay when it comes to economics. Uh, but the settlement pattern reflects what they're doing in Virginia and Maryland, and, and it's influenced by tobacco agriculture. First, even though the British wanted families to move into this area, that doesn't start to happen until about 1700. It's mostly young men who move into the Chesapeake Bay because, and a lot of them are coming as indentured servants. Um, what that means is you tend to see a lot of intermarriage in uh, Chesapeake colonial life between Native American women and English men because there's a lot of young men who are marrying age in the colony uh, and there are no, not a lot of European women there that they can marry, so they end up marrying Native Americans. Um, now, ultimately, men would drastically outnumber women till about 1700 when we start to see some parity in the numbers there. Now, rather than organizing into urban centers and towns, tight clusters of people, the Chesapeake Bay colonists spread out. And this makes sense. If your main concern is agriculture, you need a lot of land. You have to have a big open tract of land in which to plant your crops. So it could be miles until you got to the next house or the next plantation or the next uh, sort of uh, settlement over. Um, and so that means that they're really, really diffuse and spread out. This spread out pattern of settlement is going to be what leads to intense and violent conflicts between the Native Americans and the English speakers in this region. Uh, because they're spreading out, they're encroaching upon land that the Native Americans need to use. They're taking more and more that the Native Americans need to sustain themselves. And obviously that will lead to armed conflict. So we briefly have to deal with this issue of religious reform in Europe before we can understand uh, the settlement of a different area of what will be the United States, and that is New England. Uh, so there are these key religious reforms that are happening in England. As I mentioned, there's this issue of the uh, Protestant Reformation going on. This event begins in Germany in 1517, when a, a priest named Martin Luther rejected the practices of the Catholic Church, and, and at least in folklore or, or folk history, he pins what's known as his 95 Thesis to the wall of the local monastery. In that, that document, he basically lays out all of the instances of corruption and things he doesn't like with the Catholic Church. In response, the Catholic Church and the Pope are going to have him excommunicated. But his message was well received by people in the German Germanic-speaking uh, communities of Europe. Um, and so ultimately, when he is excommunicated, a bunch of other people are going to leave the Catholic Church as well literally entire nations are going to start switching towards Protestantism. Um, and so what we see going on here is that the Protestant Reformation makes England a, co a country that no longer has any ties to the papacy or the Catholic Church in Rome. They become a Protestant nation under the Church of England. Um, now, there are a group of people that emerge from this Protestant Reformation in England known as Puritans. They felt that the Church of England is going to successfully navigate these Protestant reforms. Uh, but there is another group, a, a subgroup of Puritans known as separatists. And they feared that England, under the new King Charles I, would lapse back into Catholicism. That was their number one fear. This fear drove these separatists to look for a new land in which they could practice their really strict and rigid form of Christianity. Um, now, these separatists are better known to history as pilgrims. 
Uh, the Pilgrims are going to first move out of England to Holland. They go across the English Channel uh, and they settle in, in, in the uh, Dutch nation of Holland. They thought there, because they were already Protestant and they, there was no threat of Catholicism there, they thought they could live their lives free of interference and practice their religious ideals. But most of the group is going to decide that uh, Holland is far too liberal for them. They don't like how they're practicing Christianity there. So they briefly returned to England before crossing the Atlantic in 1620 on a boat known as the Mayflower. Uh, they're supposed to actually land just a bit north of the Chesapeake Bay, near Virginia and Maryland. Uh, but they actually get blown off course, and they land near modern-day Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Most of the modern-day people are going to know this group as the Pilgrims. Uh, now, the funny thing is, because they got blown off course, they are not legally bound by the Virginia colony's rule. They're under the rules of a different colony known as the Plymouth Colony. Um, and they're going to establish a settlement known as the Plymouth Colony. Uh, and there they write up a document known as the Mayflower Compact in 1620 when they land at what they call Plymouth Rock. This document is understandably going to include very heavy religious overtones, since the entire reason this group fled to the United States was religious. Um, and there's repeated references to Christian doc doctrine. But what this is, is it's, a, it's a, a form of early constitution. It's a rule book setting up the government for the Plymouth Colony. And it's all of the, the settlers agreeing that that is how it's going to be governed. And so in many ways, it represents the first document laying out governance and societal rules in an English-speaking colony of the Americas. Um, so Native Americans and pilgrims, uh, did not immediately get along, uh, but we have this big story of Thanksgiving, and, and really what that is all about is it re relates back to um, an individual uh, name, uh, named Squanto, and so this is, the pilgrims are showing up there not really understanding the terrain, they don't know what game animals they can hunt for, they don't know a lot about the environment. Uh, so, and they also have no way of communicating with the Pawtuxet Native Americans that are living right around them in that region of the United States. Uh, but five years earlier, a guy by the name of Squanto, a Native American, uh, was taken from this coast by English fishermen. And he was taken back to England where he ultimately converted to Christianity and learned English. He is going to be the one who actually helps these settlers survive. And he's the one who sets up the friend real flint friendly relations between the Pawtuxet and the Pilgrims in this area that would lead to our first Thanksgiving. Uh, he, because he knew English and uh, he knew Pawtuxet, he could communicate with both groups, and he helped the English speakers get on their feet in this colony. So without Squanto, it, it's highly unlikely that the, the Pilgrims and their very small settlement at Plymouth Colony would uh, have uh, made it very far or survive. Um, now, the Pilgrims are the first ones on the scene in New England, and they're settling it with this idea of religious freedom, that they're going to be uh, getting away from this, the, this potential lapse into Catholicism back in England. Uh, now, Charles I took the throne and initially looked like he was going to be friendly towards Catholic influences. That is very, very upsetting to tens of thousands of English Puritans, and it's going to drive them towards the Americas. Now, remember, the Pilgrims are not are Puritans, but not all Puritans are pilgrims. They're an offshoot group. It's not the pilgrims who largely populate New England and lead to the sort of social uh, setting that will give rise to the Salem witch trials. That is Puritan ideology. The Puritans start to freak out, and they think that England is going to lapse back into Catholicism. And so they look to America as a place where the Puritans could build what they call a city on the hill. This is a biblical metaphor that represents their belief that they are the only true, thus the name Puritan or pure Christians, practicing in the world, and that they are going to be a beacon for the practice of pure Christianity. In other words, they're, they are the only real Christians in the world as far as they are concerned. That's going to become important when we get to the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, now, under uh, the leadership of a guy named John Winthrop, he was a Puritan and later would become the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, he helped to promote the idea of the American colonies as being a place 
where Puritans could stay on the true path of God. Under Winthrop's leadership, uh, the English settlers not only came to uh, uh, populate the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but they grow so quickly that they start spilling over into Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, and they're and they're and they're getting there by 1830s, uh, sorry, 1636 and 1679. Uh, technically, New Hampshire started settlement in the 1630s, but they weren't an actual province or colony until the 1670s. Uh, but between 1640 and 16 uh, and 1620 and 1640, over 20,000 Puritans pour into this region of New England. And this is why we still collectively, collectively call that area New England. We don't make distinctions between these states real often because they all have the same basic characteristics and identity in American history. They're all settled by Puritans that came into Massachusetts first and then spilled over into places like Connecticut and New Hampshire and then and New Rhode Island and then eventually Maine and Vermont as well. Um, so... Ultimately, all of those states are going to get set up, and we're not going to look at life in each of these individual colonies. We're just going to refer to it as life in New England. Um, and so in the same way that tobacco dicta dictated everything that happened in the Jamestown colony, the way they approached everything, um, this is, uh, the religion is, is everything to New England, and it's to the Puritans. It is the only reason they're here settling in the Americas in the first place. Um, and so, remember, they moved in an effort to protect their families from corruption, um, and, and that meant that unlike the Ch Chesapeake Bay colonies, they weren't moving in as just single men. They were moving entire families over to New England. Uh, their social structure and the rules of their colony are tied directly to religious zeal. Uh, ministers, for fear of corruption, are not allowed to hold political office in these societies. Uh, they wield incredible social influence, however. Liberty as a concept, one that we're going to hear a lot about later in America's history, uh, is, is really afforded only by somebody's place within the social hierarchy. Uh, God, as far as the Puritans are concerned, God puts you where you're supposed to be. Uh, an idea of natural rights doesn't exist yet. Nobody's born with equality. Nobody's born with the same rights. If you're poor, it's because God wants you to be poor, and you're a horrible Christian, and that's why you're poor. If I'm rich, God loves me because I'm a good Puritan, and I deserve everything that I got. And so this is kind of the mindset of these New England colonies. And a good example of this is for those of you who uh, have read the Scarlet Letter, it used to be assigned reading back when I was in school, uh, that is reflective of uh, life in a New England colony. Um, now, this religious motivation, uh, it would drastically alter their settlement patterns and put them in sharp contrast with the Chesapeake Bay Colony. So whereas the Chesapeake Bay Colonies are all spreading out trying to find farmland, the New England Colonies cluster together. They like these tight-knit, centralized communities. There's a few different reasons for this. One, it does make it easier to defend the colonies from Native American raids or raids by other Europeans, in particular there's concern about French influence from Canada in this region. Uh, but more importantly, when people are all living closely clustered together in these tight-knit groups, uh, it allows the local religious leaders, the Puritan religious leaders, to basically watch everybody, to spy on everybody. If you're going to sneak out at night and cheat on your wife, somebody's going to catch you, see you going to your mistress's house, and they're going to call you out, and you're going to get called out for not living as a good Puritan. So it allows the ministers and the religious leaders a much tighter social control on these uh, particular communities. Uh, this would lead to the rapid spread of towns all throughout the 1600s and early 1700s. It is not a coincidence that this, to this day, is still the most populated region of the United States. Uh, per capita versus the amount of land they're living on, People are basically living on top of each other compared to looking at the American West, where there's a lot more space and a lot fewer people. And so this had a lasting impact. The way that the religious settlement worked up there has made it so that that area is still full of urban centers, towns, and our most densely populated areas. Um, so there's some other parts in the lecture about the establishment of uh, you know, uh, the colony of New York. I'm not going to beat that up too much right now, suffices to say that the British strong-armed it away 
uh, from the Dutch, uh, who were not considered to be a particularly strong military power. Uh, but that's why you see a lot of holdover in New York. You have names, that it, place names you see there like uh, Stuyvesant, named after Peter Stuyvesant, the first governor of uh, New Netherlands, the New Netherlands colony in the city of New Amsterdam, which is New York City. Uh, you have the, the name of the main island and borough in, in New York today is Manhattan. That's the name of a Dutch town. You have things like uh, Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood, the Catskill Mountains, the Schuylkill Mountains. These are all holdovers from the Dutch colonial period. I also talk in the PowerPoint slide briefly about the establishment of the Pennsylvania colony. This one's kind of interesting, and I am going to take a minute or two to talk about that here. Pennsylvania is in the same way that Maryland is the Catholic colony and New England is the Puritan colonies. Pennsylvania is the Quaker colony. It's established by a guy named William Penn. Uh, he is a noted Quaker in American society, uh, sorry, English society. Uh, but again, we got to go do a little bit of econ uh, political history in Europe. We've got to understand what's going on over there. Ba uh, there was a civil war in England that lasted uh, between 1649 when Charles I, King Charles I of England, was assassinated. His son, Charles II, had a fleet, and he left the, the territory uh, between 1649 and 1660, and there was a civil war throughout that entire time. Um, and the side, his side ultimately won the war, and so Charles was able to come back and take the throne of England in 1660. Um, and so they call this the Restoration Period, uh, between 1660 and 1685. Charles II comes back and takes his place after living in exile in the Netherlands. Um, so the Quakers are a religious group that believe in holy conversion and what they call the God in every man. Uh, and basically, let me just put this into plain speech for you. They don't believe in going out and throwing a Bible in someone's face and saying, you have to believe this is the one true religion. The Quakers say, I'm going to live my life doing right by myself, by my family, by everybody else. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be uh, up forthright. I'm not going to uh, you know, commit sins. I'm not going to do bad things. I'm not going to hurt anybody. Um, and so by doing this, my neighbors are going to see me living like a good person, and they're going to see all the benefits that this has, has brought me, and they're going to want to convert. That's what they call holy conversion, that I don't need to tell you to convert. You'll just see how happy I am being a Quaker, and you'll convert. Um, now, there's another key aspect of the Quakers that you need to understand, and that is that they are uh, ultimately pacifists. They refuse to fight or engage in armed conflict. Uh, because of that, they don't engage in slavery or anything like that, but they also don't fight in wars. And there was a long, protracted, bloody civil war that occurred in England. The Quakers are going to survive that civil war, but when the war comes to an end, they are one of the most hated groups, and they're hated by everybody. Uh, because, for the most part, the Quakers sat there and said, I don't care who wins the Civil War. We don't want to fight. That makes them seem disinterested, like they don't care in the future of the country. They don't look like real citizens of England. And so both sides of the Civil War, both the losing and the winning side, hate the Quakers because they refuse to get involved in fighting this war. So they're facing persecution, and they're going to leave to come to the United States to set up a Quaker colony that they call Pennsylvania, originally called Penn Woods. Um, in 1681, William Penn was ceded a tract of land by Charles II when he reclaimed the throne. Um, so he named it after his father, also named William Penn, so you know, he named it after himself. Uh, Penn, and so they call it Pennsylvania. Uh, now, originally this was seen as being a utopian community where everybody's allowed to practice their religion, everybody lives equal and free. Uh, but uh, over time, it's a place of religious tolerance. There's the Quakers don't believe in slavery. Um, ultimately, this the economic motivations that kind of uh, spurred on the growth in the rest of the colonies overturned a lot of these policies. Uh, but we do see a holdover of the establishment of these communities right up until today. That holdover is the the preponderance of German, Amish, and Mennonite communities. If you're driving through this area of Pennsylvania, and it's a little bit closer up in my neck of the woods, and I've been through there many times, you'll be driving down the freeway and you pass up a horse-drawn carriage. 
Those are Amish people. They, they live as if it's still the 1800s. They don't use things with electricity. They don't drive cars. They shun modern uh, amenities. Um, and they moved there because they were facing persecution in Germany during this time period. And Pennsylvania was a place where they could practice their form of Christianity freely. So the most readily available example, I think one that you'll all be familiar with here, is if you've ever watched The Office, uh, Dwight K. Schrute, that character, has this, he, he will break into just saying German phrases and has this weird attachment to German folklore and, and uh, sort of tradition. And that's because he grew up in a German Mennonite community, supposedly, this character. Um, and so they call the rest of us English, uh, even to this day. Uh, they, if they see a person from uh, the wider American community, they call us English. Uh, but they're still living there right up into today, and they're a holdover from this particular time period. Um, so there, and before I, I just, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm not going to dive into the case studies here too deeply. Um, I'm going to talk about it very briefly and let the PowerPoints and the books sort of speak for themselves. Before we do that, though, there is something interesting going on in the 1600s that you all need to be aware of. Um, and it's something that will come up more a little bit next week. But we're going to be talking about, throughout the entire duration of this course, slavery in America. It's the big topic that we're always going to be grappling with. Um, and in our, in our last lecture where I talk about the Atlantic slave trade, I, I briefly mentioned America doesn't necessarily engage too heavily in the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, and that is true because they they have a healthy domestic slave trade. They don't need to get on a boat and sail to Africa to get a slave. They can find that in markets in the Caribbean or in the early days of settlement. And then later on in America's history, colonial and independent, they can buy slaves from American markets. They don't need to go into the Atlantic. Um, but America's model of slavery, you have to understand where this came from. Uh, we have specific rules that govern our slave system here. Those are directly imported from Barbados. Uh, Barbados is an English settlement. It's an island that was claimed by the British in 1625, and they began putting settlements there in 1627. Uh, early on, they had about 80 English settlers and 10 indentured servants. But the island starts to grow rapidly because a lot of the newly arrived Englishmen start planting uh, tobacco, and they start making a healthy trade in tobacco. Um, and so a lot of these newly incoming, coming, uh, indentured servants, some of them are, are flat out criminals, are being shipped into uh, uh, this particular island to work in the tobacco industry. But when the Chesapeake Bay starts producing all this tobacco, they are gonna kinda outshine uh, the island economy. They're gonna outshine Barbados because they have more land and more resources. So they take a bigger share of the tobacco trade. Um, after the English Civil, Civil War, from about 1640 onward, they decide, forget tobacco, let's focus on what the Spaniards and, and the, to a lesser degree the Portuguese are doing. And they're all cultivating sugarcane. Uh, and so when they start to establish sugarcane as a crop, this has really high mortality rates. Number one, the, the white indentured servants, they don't fare very well in a tropical environment doing hard labor all day. Uh, and no doubt about it, sugarcane is probably the most labor-intensive and uh, high-risk industry in the Americas. It requires huge labor forces uh, that have just brute force labor. You need people to just go through and hack at these sugar canes, and it's incredibly dangerous. If you've ever seen a sugar cane, they're about that thick around. And people are just sitting there in a line hacking at it with a machete. A lot of times somebody gets through it easier than they thought and they hack into the arm of the guy next to him who's going to get gangrene, have his arm cut off, and probably die. Mortality is extremely high in the early Atlantic world for everybody on all sides of the Atlantic. Um, so they can't drum up enough labor here in these colonies from indentured servants. So they, like their Spanish and Portuguese neighbors in the Caribbean, turn to African slaves. By the latter half of the 17th century, the late 1600s, Barbados has a massive population, and the slave classes drastically outnumber the planter class, or the freeborn whites. This is a huge problem for them, and you'll see this trend again and again. When the slave class outgrows the planter class, the planter class gets really scared. The slave owners freak out, because now rebellion is really easy, and very, very likely to be successful. 
And so what they do is they are going to start enacting strict slave laws. And this would lead to the codification of slave laws in English law. And it dictates the relationship between slave and master. Um, in particular, because sugarcane is so horrible, it's such an awful crop to have to cultivate, there are high rates of runaways that hide out in the mountains in Barbados. There's a maroon community up there, uh, meaning African slaves that are living, uh, that have broken away, uh, and then they establish free communities there. So there's high rates of uh, escaped slaves in Barbados. Because of that, they create a, a rule as part of their slave code that says the slave is property of the master. This ties to that high rate of runaways. They are practicing uh, th this part type of slavery because if I lose a slave and then I go and I try to get him back later, he's already broken free. Now, technically, he's just a free person. He's no longer my slave because I lost control of him. So under English law, they guarantee the slave owner those property rights. If I go and I find my escaped slave, I can take him back because he's not a person. He is property. He belongs to me. Um, and so that is, is why we, uh, we classify in the English-speaking world in the modern period slaves as property rather than as people. And this is a form of slavery that they call chattel slavery. Now, the rules for Barbados slavery, they are going to be imported from um, Barbados directly into Charleston, South Carolina, right, starting in the late 16 and early 1700s. Large numbers of Barbadian planters are going to move into that region of the United States, and with them, they're bringing their slaves, and also with them, they are bringing the slave laws of Barbados. Now, there's one other slave law I do want to touch on real briefly here, uh, because it, it is very, very important to uh, what we're going to see happening in the Americas. The idea uh, of basically genetic or hereditary slavery is innate in American slavery. We have this situation where uh, ultimately the slave is a slave is born a slave in the American uh, in American culture, uh, and so it, it has everything to do with the child's mother. If the child's mother is a slave, then the child will be a slave. That's not a rule from Barbados. That is a rule that was established in uh, the Vice Royalty of Mexico in the uh, Spanish colony of New Spain in 1636. And then the southern uh, colonies of the Americas are going to borrow that rule from the Spanish in 1662. It gets adopted by Virginia and then spreads around the rest of those American colonies. Uh, but that would dictate that a slave, uh, slave mother determines uh, the status of her child. Um, so that's going to be where I wrap up in this lecture. I strongly recommend you take a look at the two case studies. Bacon's Rebellion highlights the spread out pattern of settlement that we talked about in the Chesapeake Bay and the incumbent violence that jumps off between white settlers uh, and their uh, Native American uh, neighbors in this region of the Chesapeake Bay. So it's highlighting exactly what I've been talking about throughout this lecture. And then the other case study is the Salem Witch Trials. That is intended to show you how deeply these Puritans uh, uh, believe in this Puritan ideology, how pervasive it is within New England culture. Um, and so that's something that you'll definitely want to take a look at those PowerPoint slides and read about that in the textbook as well. So that wraps it up for me. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to shoot me an email um, or set up a Zoom appointment. Thanks.